okay so this will not be my most controversial video because I've talked about the judgment according to works already in other videos <clears throat> but it will be the most controversial of the videos that I'm doing on Romans um, and today we're going to cover verses uh, chapter 1 verse 18 through the end of chapter 2 because again I'm not trying to reproduce what Matthew Henry and so many other commentators have done <clears throat> excuse me I am trying to give some important points from Romans an important perspective on Romans in the light of modern day evangelical tradition um, which has completely in in my opinion and actually in comparison between the interpretation of the descendants of the reformation the evangelicals um their their interpretation of of romans is way off from the way romans was interpreted in the beginning and in this video i'm going to give you the reason why um I'm going to argue that from chapter 1, verse 18, you know, once Paul is done arguing that his gospel, he is, is excellent because it produces righteousness in people. He then is going to talk about what is foundational uh, to the rest of Romans up to chapter 8, where he finishes talking about, you know, exactly what his gospel is. Then in 9 through 11, he talks about, you know, the issue of the Gentiles versus the Jews. And then 12 through 16, he gives, you know, his standard um, moral guidance, his, his uh, exhortations to people who are Christians. Um, but in 1, 18 through 2, 20, Eight, I think is the last verse in Romans 2 um, he gives a foundation for what's to come through the theological part up through Romans 8 where he is explaining his gospel and the foundational point that he is making is that righteous people are rewarded with eternal life and unrighteous people are rightly condemned by God and punished with death. So the first, you know, verse 18 on. So starting in verse 18, he says, and, and I'm in the New American Standard, and now there's a 2020 version out. This is the 2020 version. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So his beginning statement, I'm talking about the wrath of God here. Now he's going to continue to be talking about the wrath of God for a long time. Okay, so he goes on, he gives a, a description of people who don't know God, they worship nature rather than God. And you know, this was common uh, before Christianity exploded all over the world, that the gods of people were, were creatures, animals. Um, so, you know, he talks about what that leads to and the kind of shameful behavior that that leads to. I don't need to go through to all of that. And, um, you know, he gets to the end and makes this long list of evil things that people do in verses like 29, 30, 31. And then in 32, he writes, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So he's gone. Sin brings about death. People who sin are worthy of death. The wrath of God is upon them rightly. So now we go to chapter 2, and he starts in the chapter 2. Um, basically what's going to end up happening is that he goes, Hey Jews, the wrath of God is on you too. So... First, he, he speaks very generally about people who judge someone else and then do that themselves. Um, and then verse 3, he says again, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. So he has spent all the way from verse 18 emphasizing that the wrath of God 
The judgment of God is right and correct in judging people who do the kind of things he's been describing at the end of Romans 1. Now, he's emphasizing it again here because he's about to go, hey, you Jews, even though you know the law, if you do these things, you're under the wrath of God too. So um, he goes on. Uh, so verse 3, do you suppose this, you foolish person who passes judgment on those who practice such things, and yet do them as well, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and restraint and patience? So he's talking about the Jews here. He's talking about all these years God has been kind and he's restrained himself. He's been patient with the Jews um, all these years. And then he goes, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Now, most people read this with the emphasis on um, kindness, uh, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. In other words, they're going, it's not God's wrath that leads you to repentance. It's his kindness that leads you to repentance. But that's not true. God's wrath also leads to repentance. His emphasis here is on repentance. Don't you know that the kindness of God leads you to repentance and not to something else? The kindness of God should not lead you to continue practicing unrighteousness because he's been so forbearing with you Jews. He's been forbearing you, but that doesn't mean that you should just continue making him have to have patience and kindness towards you. He will not go on with that eternally. And so then he says, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, because you have not repented in response to kindness, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will repay each person according to his deeds. Now, he hasn't yet directly said, I'm talking about you Jews, but he has implied it by discussing the kindness and patience of God, which was towards Israel under the Old Testament. And all Jews would have known that. They would not think that God has shown kindness and patience with, with the Gentiles, but with themselves. And he's going, that should have provoked you to repentance. But because it did not pro provoke you to repentance, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Okay, you're just like all these people you've been judging. They weren't doing right. You could read in the law that they weren't doing right. And so you judge them, but you're living just like them. So you're storing up wrath for yourself too, even though you've had the kindness of God, which should have led you to repentance instead of stubbornness. Okay, so then he says, God will repay, in this is verse six, each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance and doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Now the standard evangelical response to this is not to believe it, but to dismiss it by saying that that is hypothetical. In other words, if we could do good, then this would be true. But since Romans 3, the next chapter, which really does say that we can't do good, then this doesn't apply. But that is the wrong way to look at this. This is true. Don't dismiss any verses of Scripture. Romans 3 is going, nobody's righteous. All of you are in danger of having this applied to you. So what do you think God's answer is? To change the judgment? Paul has just been telling you how righteous the judgment is. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 20 to 30, God presents an argument himself speaking to Israel about how just his judgment is. Jesus didn't need to die to change God or to change God's judgment. We're the ones who needed to Jesus to die for us. So Romans 3 tells us how wicked we all are, puts everybody in sin so that we would realize that Jesus needs to die for us. But the reason he dies for us is so that we can do good. Now, if you'll go read Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, you'll see that that is totally the focus of both grace and Jesus's death. 
The great, so Titus 2, 11 through 14 says that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live godly, righteously, and soberly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from iniquity and to purchase for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So he redeemed us from unrighteousness. He gave us grace, which teaches us not to be ungodly anymore, but how to be godly. It says that about the scriptures as well in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. They're inspired and they're, prof and, and they're profitable for teaching, correction, rebuke, and instruction in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for, for good works. God saved us by grace through faith apart from works so that we would not be able to, ba to, to boast. But then, therefore, he created us in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2.10, created us in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared for us to do. So Jesus died to make us good and godly people who can be given eternal life on the last day. We won't be those who face the wrath of God. So first, you know, this is described in Romans chapter 5, verse 9 and 10 where we were reconciled to God by Jesus' death, but we shall be saved from wrath through his life. And so we got his death. Okay, that ended all the past. The past was put away. We get to start over, reconciled with God. But now we get saved from the wrath of God, which comes up rightly and justly upon those who do evil, we get saved to that from that wrath by the grace of God and by the Spirit of God and by the Scriptures and by the the, the um, atonement, so that we are no longer unrighteous people. We do righteous things, so that God, who sees us patiently continuing to do good because we have been empowered to do so, created in Christ Jesus to do so, taught by the scriptures to do so, empowered by grace to do so, he sees us patiently continuing to do good and he rewards us with eternal life. Now, Romans 2, 6 and 7, again, it is not hypothetical, it is practically repeated in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7, 8, and 9, and it's prefaced by do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. He who sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap everlasting life. Therefore, Every time you see therefore, you need to find out what the therefore is there for, okay? Because if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap everlasting life. Therefore, do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap if you do not faint, okay? That completely matches Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Persevere in, do, in doing good. Don't grow weary in doing good, okay? He will reward us with eternal life if we will do righteousness. Okay, now Romans 3, the next chapter, is going to go on to say that we can't do righteousness. So Jesus died so that we could. When we get to Romans 7 and 8, it is so clear in Romans 7 and 8. He explains why the law can't cause people to do good. It's because of our flesh. We have sin in our flesh. He spends a whole chapter explaining that. And then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He doesn't say no one. He said, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus delivers us from that body of death. And in the next chapter, he says the same thing. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has delivered us from the law of sin and death. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Now, what law of sin and death is he talking about? He's talking about Romans 7. The law comes, reveals sin, we sin, and we have death. 
That's the law of sin and death. But in 8.2, he begins to explain the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And it goes in Romans 8.3 like this. For what the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh, the problem that you read about in Romans 7. It was condemned by Jesus' death. God did by Jesus' death what the law could not do, which is give us the power to overcome sin. God did it. He condemned sin in the flesh and so that the righteous requirement of the law, verse 4 of Romans 8, would be fulfilled in those of us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Then he talks about walking to the Spirit in verses 5 through 11. Then in verse 12, he says, So then, brothers, we are not debtors to live according to the flesh, because we, if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, then we will live. In other words, he's still referring back to this basic principle. The wrath of God rightly comes upon people who do the things that are listed in Romans chapter 1. And it rightly comes upon people who know to do good but don't do it, as explained in verses 1 through 5. We who know to do good and don't do it, we're storing up the wrath of God for ourselves. We're not storing up the mercy of Jesus for ourselves. We're storing up the wrath of God. Jesus came to make us righteous. And again, I have to say this every time because of that ridiculous evangelical doctrine that God is going to send people to hell over one sin. That comes from James 2.10 that talks about us judging one another. It's, it's just an awful insult to God. People end up going, God is so holy, you can't forgive even one sin. How is that holy? I can forgive a sin. That makes me more holy than if I didn't forgive. Okay, God is more holy because he forgives than he would be if he didn't forgive. That idea that he's so holy he can't forgive is outrageously ridiculous and an insult to God who really is holy and really is merciful. It is throughout the Old Testament when he introduces himself to to Moses, as he walks by Moses in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, he introduces himself as the God of life, loving kindness who forgives sins. When he talks about the judgment in Ezekiel 18, he says, those who have done wickedness, if they'll turn away from their wickedness and do righteousness, I'll forget all the wickedness they ever done. That is in the Old Testament. God has always been a forgiver. And he doesn't need sacrifices to forgive. That's in Psalm 51. Towards the end, David goes, I wanted to offer sacrifice, but that's not what you want. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit and a contrite heart or broken heart, one or the other. But the point is that repentance is what brings about forgiveness. Repentance followed by obedience. I desire obedience and not sacrifice, is what the Lord said. And he is saying that throughout Romans. The sacrifice is for the purpose of bringing about obedience in us. And you will see that throughout Romans. So this is laying a foundation, okay? You cannot ignore that righteous people, people who persevere in doing good, receive eternal life. But to those, verse 8, who are self-serving and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, he will give wrath and indignation. Okay, so the wrath of God comes upon those who don't live righteously. And that is said in first, and I, yeah, I'm going to appeal to first John 3, 7 through 10 over and over as we go through Romans. And again, that begins with little children, don't be deceived. He who practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Okay. Now the word that says justify throughout Romans can be translated make righteous, or it can be translated justify, but it doesn't matter how you translate that because the principle that you learn from 1 John 3, 7 is that the only people who are righteous in the eyes of God, the only people who are righteous as Jesus is righteous, are those who practice righteousness. That is a foundational truth. Don't let go of it. 
He will impute to you the righteousness of Christ if you walk in the righteousness that he imparted to you through the death of Christ, through grace, through the scriptures, through the exhortation and help of your brothers and sisters in Christ. All of those things are supposed to cause you to do good works, which I cover in all my other videos and have already said once. So there's judgment for those who don't do good and there's eternal life for those who do. So that is what the rest of Romans chapter three through eight is about. You cannot separate being justified and having right standing with God from doing righteousness. And first John is the place to read about that even more than Romans, even though Paul says it. But John emphasizes, hammers at home and hammers at home and hammers at home and hammers at home, okay? If you're not keeping the commands of Christ, you don't know God. Um, if you if you're not walking in the light, you're not Christ's. If you don't love your brother, you don't love God. He, he, he writes all of that in First John. OK, the righteousness of God that is imputed to us goes with the righteousness of God that is imparted to us. You cannot have one without the other. And that is true throughout all of this. So where you read, read justify, don't wrestle with, is that talking about making us righteous or giving us right standing with God? It is talking about both. He both reconciles us by Jesus' death and he saves us from wrath by his life. The picture of that is in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. That's true of Paul. That's true of us. Both things, Jesus gave us right standing with God by reconciling us through his death, and he delivered us from slavery to sin through the resurrection from the dead which we duplicate in being baptized. That's in Romans chapter six, very clear. I don't need to explain it to you, you can go read it. So anyway, let's go quickly through the rest of this because I already made the main point I, I wanted to make. Um, so verse 11 is where he really starts tackling the Jew Gentile thing here and lets the Jews know that even though you're a Jew, even though you sacrifice, even which uh, they, yeah, they probably still were at that point. The temple may have still been around. So just because you sacrifice, just because you follow the food laws, just, just because you keep the Sabbath, that's not going to do you any good if you don't practice righteousness. The wrath of God will be heaped on you because you're living like the, like the Gentiles who are in the world. So he says in verse 11, there is no partiality with God. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, okay? You sinned, you broke the law, you're going to get judged just like the Gentiles who aren't keeping the law. For it is not the hearers of the law, verse 13, who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Of course, James says the same thing in James chapter one, that the New Testament is very consistent. Once you get in your head that righteous people are rewarded with eternal life and the unrighteous are condemned. It, it makes the whole New Testament just click, 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 fall right into place. And as long as you understand that faith is believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That is saving faith. John chapter 20, verse 31, and Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. That's the faith that you need to be justified. Yes, that justification came from Jesus dying for our sins, but it's not believing that Jesus died for our sins that saves us. It's believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Again, John chapter 20, verse 31, and Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. We read faith everywhere, and we assume that means faith that Jesus died for our sins, but that is not the right faith. The right faith is that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and so you begin obeying him by the power of that he gives you and that you obtained because of his atonement. So, um, I think I was on verse 13. It's hard to see these verse numbers on this Bible here. 
For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law instinctively perform the requirements of the law, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves, and that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience testifying, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of mankind through Christ Jesus. And yes, he just said that if Gentiles will obey their conscience, then their conscience will defend them on judgment day and they will receive eternal life because those who patiently continue to do good, even if they never heard the gospel of Christ, which is very unlikely to happen because we are by nature sinners. But if they do, their conscience can excuse them on the day when God will judge the secrets of mankind through Christ Jesus. We need to just believe what the Bible says instead of going, well, that's not what I was taught. Well, everybody who teaches you said you should be reading the Bible and making sure that, that, that they're teaching you the truth. So believe the Bible and go, oh, they taught me wrong. This isn't that hard. It's plain and simple. Okay, we just really don't want to believe that good people get eternal life and bad people get condemnation. That, you know, we don't because we've been, no, 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 that's not what's going on. But yes, 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 that is what's going on. And it's all over the place in the New Testament. Okay, you're not okay just because you believed. You are okay in the sense that you have received the Holy Spirit. You've been given grace. You've been empowered to live a holy life. There's no reason you shouldn't. Okay, and if you have some pet besetting sin, then you've got to run to the church. Your heart will, if you try to fight those things alone, Hebrews 3.13 says that unless you're exhorted every day, you are in danger of being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Okay, so you've got your brothers and sisters. Go to someone you can trust. Confess your sin because that sin will drag you into the lake of fire. Okay, now I actually believe that the lake of fire is going to cause people to perish, not to be tortured eternally. But nonetheless, if you don't do righteousness, you won't receive eternal life. Okay, you've been given as a Christian everything you need to do righteousness, including the help of your brothers and sisters, which you need. Okay, the, the Bible doesn't just say forsaking the, the, the assembling of yourselves together. It says, know one another to provoke to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, but exhorting and all the more as you see the day approaching. So we have to exhort one another. We have to know how to provoke one another to love and good works. That's the church. That's assembling ourselves together. So you've got to get to know people so you can exhort them and they can exhort you. And that will help you get past these sins you have that you can't overcome that will drag you to hell. Okay? They'll drag you to hell. People who do good, patiently continue to do good, not sinless perfection. 1 John chapter 1, verses, verse 7 through chapter two, verse two, let you know that it is not sinless perfection, okay? God just wants a pattern of righteousness and he will grant the righteousness of Christ to you. First John chapter three, verse seven. So that's what's going on here, okay? So, um, here, let's see if my, my Bible kind of restarted here. Um, but basically then he goes on to the end. Let me jump towards the end because I've used 28 minutes of your time and my time already. And basically goes, there's not a difference between Gentiles and Jews when it comes to the judgment. Okay, the ones that are, and now my Bible doesn't, but it doesn't want to load up. So I'm going to have to do this from memory. Okay, so he tells us at the end that he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, whose circumcision is of the flesh, but he is a Jew who's one inwardly, whose circumcision is of the heart and the spirit. And the point he's making through all of Romans 2, so please read it, is that those who do good will be rewarded with eternal life. Those who do not do good but obey unrighteousness and reject the truth, 
they will be condemned. They'll receive wrath and indignation on the day when God judges the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. Okay, that's 118 through 228. Jews and Gentiles are the same. There is one judgment for all. It is without partiality, and it is according to works, which we should have because we've received grace, the atonement, the scriptures, the help of one another to patiently continue to do good and be forgiven on an ongoing basis when we fail. So um, please read the passages that I've been going over. They, they just say plainly what I'm saying they're saying. I and mean, there's no denying that. So we'll work with three and four, which the evangelicals love, because, you know, it doesn't necessarily call for the same obedience that chapter six and chapter two call for. But that doesn't mean we can ignore two and six. We have to understand three and four for what they say and two and six for what they say. We have to put it all together into one narrative that makes sense in every chapter. And it's really not very hard to do if you are not obstinately rejecting the judgment according to works. But if you are, then this is an incredibly puzzling book. So um, if you got something out of this, please click subscribe, click the bell if you would like to be notified um, of my future posts. Sorry for a little bit of slurring words because this is my third video I've done. I've had brain radiation and a lot of chemo, so sometimes it's hard for my mouth to keep up with my thoughts. But nonetheless, I think you can follow all those thoughts and see them in scripture. Thank you.